in front of us now. And then, um, oh yeah, it's just recording. So, and Mauricio decided to take this one step further and not just write a paper, uh, but also try to test um, whether, you know, Cleros can be regarded as arbitration. And uh, we have this really, really special news today that a uh, ruling produced by, by Cleros was accepted uh, for the first time as a valid ruling under a traditional court uh, law in specifically in, in Mexico. So this is a really huge step, not only for Cleros and decentralized justice, but also in a more general sense for all of the industry of blockchain and arbitration, right? So we assembled here um, a panel with, um, of course, Mauricio and some and two other uh, experts, uh, commentators and practitioners and scholars um, to discuss this, this very important situation. And let me first um, introduce you to, to them. So Mauricio Virues is an attorney who graduated with honors from Universidad Panamericana. He holds a master in constitutional justice from the Universidad de Guadalajara, Guadalajara and is a member of the 2019 and 2020 class at the LLM litigation and dispute resolution at the University College of London. He is the founder and director of a leading Mexican law firm with a specialized practice in civil justice and alternative dispute resolution. Welcome, Mauricio. Um, Sophie Nappert is an arbitrator in independent practice based in London. She holds degrees in both common law and civil law from McGill University and a master's degree in law from King's College London. She's dual qualified as an avocat of the Bar de Quebec, Canada, and a solicitor of the Supreme Court of England and Wales. In 2019, she completed the University of Oxford's side business school program on blockchain strategy. I think that's when I first met Sophie and she was like falling through the rabbit hole um, at Oxford. <laughs> um, she's a, a guest lecturer at Columbia Law School, McGill University Faculty of Law, and Harvard Law School, uh, also, also known to some by as the McGill of the South. Um, and uh, well, Sophie created the Napper Prize in, in arbitration open to young scholars and practitioners worldwide, a minister under the auspices of McGill University. And in 2021, she co founded Arbtech, a worldwide online community forum fostering cross disciplinary dialogue on technology, dispute resolution, and the future of justice. I really encourage you to join this. Um, community, which is awesome. And everyone who is working on the future of, of law is, and arbitration is, is there. So uh, join it like now. And last but not least, Luis is a doctoral candidate at Stanford Law School, where he researched uh, on the role of non-legal actors, mainly expert witnesses in international resolution. He's currently visiting scholar at the Max Planck Institute at Luxembourg for procedural, procedural law and practices international arbitration with a boutique law firm with presence around the world. Luis was a Cleros Fellow in 2018. Oh, he was part of our first batch. And he has served as a juror in a handful of times and has really recently co-authored an important case study on centralized justice and blockchain arbitration that uses Cleros as a case study. Uh, this was at the Ohio Journal of Digital Solution. Uh, so congratulations on that, Luis. I'm going to let um, Mauricio present uh, first for, for a while to let us know what is this very historical moment, and then we will proceed to, to some discussion. Please, Mauricio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today and uh, to finally have the opportunity to share with all of you uh, our findings in terms of how to accommodate Claros in a particular case that um, ultimately leads to the possibility of a court of law uh, to um, recognize and enforce a decision reached by Claros. And um, um, this project, this particular project uh, has been um, sort of delayed for a while. It, I feel like it, it, it should have gone uh, faster if the pandemics didn't stop the Mexican courts for several months uh, last year. So, well, but finally we are where we wanted to be. And um, 
I'd like to start uh, with the whole story. I first uh, learned about Cleros by attending a conference that Federico held at Oxford University while I was studying uh, my, my postgraduate in a UCL. I was um, reflecting a lot about access to justice and how do the entire world was struggling with uh, how to how to uh, how to provide uh, access to justice for 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 a white population uh, among uh, digital environments that uh, are growing around the world and this and this all of this was a pre-pandemic scenario. So now it's it's a uh, completely um, if you know different and more political more politically um, important to to be able to accommodate these digital uh, tools among uh, justice systems. So when I went, when I learned what Cleros was and how it worked, I was I was impressed about uh, pretty much the whole idea how how it uh, promotes accuracy by, by, by placing economic incentives in the jurors. You know, you, you, win, you can win more if you, if, you, um, if you make a right decision, and which is, which is kind of an opposite idea of, of, what, of what a lawyer would have a picture or depict as a, as a fair juror. Um, a fair juror traditionally would be somebody who has absolutely no economic interest about the case, but uh, Claro's works the other way around, which which was you know as a whole concept, it, it was very impressive. So being a lawyer, the starting point for me was to to start um, a very simple question. Uh, this system, th th this system that that has been developed uh, under the concept of Claro's, which is a whole you know uh, decision. Um, making a dispute resolution system. It is designed that way and it works that way. And it works uh, properly like a dispute resolution system. But could it be considered uh, a valid uh, arbitration proce procedure? I mean, under the legal statutes, could it be uh, uh, recognized and enforced as an, uh, as an arbitral award? You know, whatever uh, uh, Claros decides in a particular dispute, uh, so I decided, and, and I am very thankful with Federico and the Cleros team because they they led me to to take the opportunity of the fellowship to to explore and to reflect on this matter. So first, I I came up with a, uh, a theoretical uh, uh, model on on how to make Cleros work in order to be ultimately recognized and enforced. As an arbitral award, or as a you know, as a binding as, as a binding decision uh, through a national court, uh, my my original findings, my original reflections uh, were that uh, by itself, you know, uh, uh, with without without being uh, embedded in in into any other method or any other kind of dispute resolution approach, Claros would be very very clearly would have a very hard time to be recognized and enforced as an arbitral award for several reasons. The number one, it, it cannot be technically, legally, a uh, clear decision cannot be considered as a foreign award because it has no place of arbitration. It happens online, it happens in an entirely digital environment. So it's very difficult to know or to try to assign a place for it to, to, to have an existence, a legal existence or a seat. So it kind of falls out of the scope of New York Convention. Uh, secondly, the awards are not signed by the, by the arbitrators or the jurors in this case. So um, it, doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. And it would be very difficult for players to work that way because of the way it is designed and more jurors can, can join the dispute by, by, by challenging and you know, because of the recourse system that the, that the Claros uh, protocol has built into it. So what we came up with, uh, what I thought as well, maybe Claros uh, as 
you know, it, it, is, it is a system by itself. It is a whole system because it can process a dispute from, from start to end, but it could also be considered as a tool, as just as a decision tool, not, not substitute the, the dispute resolution method or other dispute resolution method, but to be used as a tool inside some other dispute resolution method. So I thought that uh, maybe uh, Kleros could be used to reach or to govern the decision of an arbitration, of a regular arbitration proceeding. Because if, if, if you have, an, if you have an, an, an arbitration clause that clearly states a place of arbitration, the, the language of the arbitration that um, appoints a, an arbitrator, then you have all you, you have all the, the the legal requirements that many or you know most jurisdictions ask for an arbitration to be valid, and uh, therefore its decisions to be binding and to fall in you know under the scope of New York Convention. But there is nothing that prevents the the arbitrator to use clearers to reach a decision because of um, of an old legal principle that is very well known in the arbitration world, the ex aequo et bono principle, which basically means that an arbitrator can, can decide uh, however he deems uh, appropriate and he doesn't need even to, to provide his reasons or he doesn't need to, to follow any particular statute or, or, or law. He just goes with it. He, he just comes with a decision because he feels that's the right decision. And that is, uh, uh, there is not prohibited by, by law, but by most of the arbitration regulation that I know, it's, it's okay if the parties agree for that. So there is no legal uh, objection for an arbitrator to use Claros as a uh, criteria, as, as a tool for reaching a decision and governing his award. So we put this theory to the test by incorporating an arbitration clause in a leasing agreement under the Mexican laws that, that expressly allowed the arbitrator, the appointed arbitrator to uh, receive the claim, the respond, and the evidence produced by the parties, and then feed uh, that to Claros in order to get a, a decision from it, and then render an arbitration, an, an arbitral award um, uh, governed by the Claro's decision, and this this, arbi this arbitral proceeding was was con was conducted uh, in such a fashion, and Claro's uh, came uh, back with a decision, and uh, the arbitrator rendered his award, and he notified the parties, and um, you know the losing party did not comply, so the winning party uh, was in need to ask for a judge to recognize and enforce such an award, which uh, was uh, the critical point uh, because the whole, you know, the whole theory, the whole model depended on, on what the judge would say. Um, if, 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 he, if, if he, you know, according to Mexican law and according to, to Mexican, uh, according to a lot of, a lot of different jurisdictions, uh, the judges are supposed to make a, a check on the, on the, legal um, viability of, of, of uh, any arbitral award that is, is asked to be um, recognized and enforced. So it was, it was uh, quite a critical point. Uh, there, there, was very, there was a very robust, um, 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 there, you know, the way in which the case was presented to the judge was, was um, um, very rough, it, had, it has a lot of arguments. It, 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 it was made bearing in mind that it was uh, something uh, very, very new and that, that uh, the judge probably never saw something like this before. And, uh, you know, lawyers tried to present as much arguments as possible in order for the judge to be um, sympathetic to this, to this claim and to see that it was really not prohibited and that it was all perfectly legal. So the court received this, um, this, uh, this claim, this petition, and they, the court did not immediately 
um, recognized the award. They first required it, they first asked uh, the, the, the claimant to produce original copies of the arbitral, um, of the arbitration clause and the arbitral award. Uh, so the claimant did so, he produced original copies of both documents, and in turn, the court actually recognized the, the, the award and gave five, uh, you know, a deadline of five business days to the losing party in order to, uh, to, to comply with the award or um, else uh, the public force would be used in the same fashion and manner that would happen for, for any, uh, any uh, um, ruling or a normal, uh, you know, normally recognized commercial award. So uh, once we had this resolution, we were able to, to um, uh, put uh, the, the application case together in order to present the complete picture uh, as uh, in terms of the Clairos Fellowship that we were pursuing. And well, uh, now I, I don't know if it's already available or it would be tomorrow or shortly for the community to, to check out and um, you know, uh, see how, how it was done, uh, how the model works. And uh, of course, uh, which, which I think is most important, how can it be replicated in other jurisdictions, which would be a, a, the final goal to have the, as many jurisdictions as possible to, to recognize Pleros, a tool that can validly be um, used to reach a decision in a private dispute resolution method. You know, even, even if it's not arbitration, maybe it could be another one, it could be an, um, just a private agreement or, uh, you know, it, it, may sound, it may sound like a little too much, but even, even judges, even, you know, even formal justice could eventually, um, you know, outsource decisions through, through this kind of, of uh, protocols. So I think it's very interesting. I, I, I want to thank you all for, for your interest. I want to thank Federico for, for the opportunity and uh, the, the patience and uh, for allowing us to be here today and present these results to, to all of you. So thank you. Uh, thank you actually, Mauricio. Let me share. So the report that Mauricio produces already online. So I'm going to share the link here. Um, you know, Mauricio, you have opened the door to like, who knows what, you know, um, like a new age in the world of arbitration, but I'm, I'm no one to say this. I'm, I'm just going to let uh, Sophie continue. Maybe she has some comments about the arbitration clause. Yeah, Sophie, uh, please, your, your turn. Thank you very now. much. And you read my mind. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank um, Federico for inviting me to what is really a historic event uh, and one that I'm privileged to witness with you. I wanted to congratulate Mauricio for uh, tremendous work. Um, I, I read the, with the great interest his report, which I think is, um, is an extremely um, well-balanced and very lucid look at the Claros Protocol. Uh, and I, I congratulate you for it. Um, I have three points really that I wanted to raise um, from my perspective as, a, as an arbitrator in uh, the dinosaur side of arbitration. Uh, and they are as follows. Um, I, I, I think your characterization of Kleros as a tool to assist the decision-making process, as you say, in this case, it's arbitration, it could be somewhere else, is a very apposite one. And it, is, it has parallels with other tools that exist out there for example, uh, the emergence of AI as a, predict as a predictive justice tool, uh, which we see in, uh, in Argentina and Prometea, for example, on the sort of criminal court side, but it, you can very well see Claros on the side of uh, more commercial decisions as a tool to assist um, dispute resolution. Another much more uh, mainstream tool uh, that came to my mind is that of baseball arbitration. So baseball arbitration is a term that means that uh, an arbitrator does not have the, is, is asked to make a decision on a dispute, but it has to choose between the offer that's put forward by the claimant 
the offer that's put forward by the respondent, it cannot choose a third way. And it has to motivate the, decision, the, the reason why it chose one or the other. That's another sort of type of tool uh, that, that is given to the arbitrator, which the arbitrator doesn't have a choice but to choose. And I can very well see Cleros as a, a tool similar to this. Now, I have a couple of queries, as you might imagine, um, from my perspective. And I, I wondered whether these were raised, first of all, whether you have considered them, and secondly, whether these were raised in front of the judge. The first um, query that I have, so I was very interested by the wording of the arbitration clause, uh, which um, I don't know who drafted it, Mauricio, I don't know if you did, or I, if you took a template from some, somewhere else, but I, it, it's very clear uh, and you say this in your report that the decision that is um, to be rendered by Claros is to be rendered on a strict legal basis and a stricto derecho in the, um, in, in the original. Now, if I read this from a lawyer's perspective, uh, that's not what Claros does. It doesn't render its decision on a strict legal basis, uh, not, not a legal basis at all actually, and it doesn't pretend to. And neither is a decision ex equo et bono on a strict legal basis, it's the opposite. It's on the basis of equity, it's on the basis of common sense, it's on the basis of morality, and you explained that as well. So I just, I mean, if, if, if I were the judge looking at this uh, carefully, I would say, well, that decision was not taken on the basis of what the arbitration clause warrants. And that to me was a tension point. I wondered whether, that was raised in front of the judge, it may be that it wasn't, and I wondered whether that was argued and what the judge thought about it. So that's my first point. But I think if you take that out of the arbitration clause, then, then you don't have a problem. Uh, the second point I wanted to raise is I, in this case, uh, as I understand it, because it was a test case, uh, the Cleros mechanism was impaneled of, by, by three jurors, uh, and I don't think that there were any appeals by the jurors uh, of that decision. I think it was a one-shot deal. But obviously, as we all know, the Claros Protocol does allow jur parties, obviously, but jurors themselves to appeal a decision uh, when, when there is a, a feeling by, by one of them that uh, the decision was not right. And I wondered how that plays into um, the construct or the, the system that you, that you advocate of, of Claros as a tool, whether that system of not infinite, but several appeals uh, may, may skew the, um, the sort of tool mechanism that you have in mind. So I wanted to make those two comments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sophie. Um, I think there are, they are both excellent points. The first one is a, is some kind of a very very uh, technical, tricky question. Um, the arbitrator, which um, the arbitrator is allowed to use the ex equo et bono principle, so that is why he can actually outsource. His decision to a to a, a tool, uh, whether it be a the toss of a coin or the use of Claros. So uh, ultimately, the one rendering the decision, the one coming with a decision, uh, is the arbitrator, not Claros itself. So what what it means for Claros to to be instructed to. Uh, come with a decision on a strict legal basis is that uh, they are supposed to, um, and, and this, is, this is very interesting because it, it touches the, the topic of how sophisticated can the disputes be in order for Claros to be effective. But Claros was supposed to decide the case on its legal merits. And they assessed evidence provided by the parties. They assessed the contract itself. And surprisingly, they did provide the arguments that were actually accurate in terms of legal merits of the positions of the parties. So um, I think that was a, a, a good thing to be able to assess Claro's ability to 
to come with a decision on a strict legal basis, which doesn't necessarily mean that the arbitrator is uh, deciding on strict legal basis. He is actually deciding on an ex aequo et bono principle because he out basically outsourced his decision. So that, you know, that's, that's for the, but, but I, I, I understand it sounds overcomplicated and it probably shouldn't be like that, but. but mm, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, I no, I don't think it's overcomplicated. I just wonder, it's probably just a matter of drafting of the arbitration clause. It might make a lot of sense to, um, to make that a little bit clearer in the arbitration clause and to use a template arbitration clause that you could plug into your contract if you wanted to use Kleros, and then that would be clear for everyone and for, oh, and for the enforcing court, of course. Yeah, yes, uh, but, but, uh, I think that's an excellent uh, point. And uh, yes, I, I think the, the arbitration clause, this kind of arbitration clause, it has a lot of room to improve and to, to um, it needs to be, it will need to be adjusted very specifically to different jurisdictions and, and it, it's, it's a whole challenge, but um, yeah, we, we have to start with, with uh, defining the principles about how, it, how, it's, how is it going to be uh, as long as it is an arbitration proceeding and it, it has a very specific set of rules to work. So, so yeah. Completely. And about the second point that that, uh, that you uh, uh, stress about what would happen if if Claros Protocol run a number of uh, appeals. Um, well, the way I see it, the decision wouldn't come back to the arbitrator until uh, Claros is is done with all the appeals. So, uh, in terms, you know. Claros may be considered as a tool in this, in this particular model, but it, it still works as a system. So it has to, it has to run all of its uh, procedural stages uh, to, come, to come up with a decision, which, uh, which in, in turn will be communicated to the arbitrator. And, and you know, understanding that that decision is final and won't, won't change later inside Claros protocol. Which I think that's an excellent point as well. Thank you. I've just put a little link in the chat uh, just to for, for people to have a little bit of a sense what we mean by ex aequo et bono. It's essentially Latin to explain a decision that is not rendered on the on the on, on the basis of strict legal rules where those rules are considered to be unfair, but on the basis of uh, principles of fairness more generally understood. Thank you, Sophie and Mauricio. And let's go now to, to Luis and uh, let's see what points he, he raises. Please, please go ahead. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, I, I think uh, enough time has passed for me to be able to disclose that I was one of the jurors who decided the question that was put before Claros. And I must also say that I didn't look to decide this case. It was just something that popped one day in my inbox. And uh, it was interesting to uh, experience firsthand uh, the decision-making that, that uh, took place in this case. It is historic indeed, as uh, Federico has um, labeled the uh, issuance of, of this ruling by, by uh, uh, a Mexican uh, district court, court of first instance, I understand. Uh, and, and I do have uh, a number of comments, uh, one of which is uh, very much along the lines, the comment that uh, Sophie made earlier. And hello, Sophie, by the way. Um, I, uh, my concerns are related uh, to a great extent to the extension, the wordiness of the arbitration clause. And I mentioned this uh, in light of the great number of uh, reported cases and the great literature that has been written about um, uh, pathological arbitration clauses that when they have been challenged in courts have uh, uh, brought us a result that uh, the arbitration was uh, or the arbitration agreement was found to be 
uh, non-existent, not binding, not present, and that therefore the arbitration that was being attempted failed. Uh, so there's always a risk with that. And, and I think uh, careful thought uh, into using these types of lengthy arbitration clauses into contracts going forward is something that um, the community as a whole needs to uh, continue paying attention uh, as to avoid any disaster uh, when, when the time is right for the, for the arbitration. Uh, I think you make a number of assumptions in justifying uh, uh, the experiment that, that you run in this case, Mauricio, and some of the, those assumptions relate to uh, the likelihood that uh, purely an award purely rendered by uh, a Claros jury would fail to be recognized and enforced under the New York Convention. And the comment that I wanted to make there is that even though your assumption might be uh, plausible or perhaps more likely than the alternatives, uh, I wonder if you would care to comment as to reasons why a Claros award, a pure Claros award, not the award that resulted from your experiment would nonetheless uh, be considered as recognizable and enforceable uh, in a court of any jurisdiction. Uh, I think uh, I'm not entirely, by this, what I'm trying to say is that I'm not entirely convinced that Cleros is entirely delocalized. I understand it is a French incorporated entity and an argument could be made that uh, an award that is issued under Claros could be covered by uh, this Frenchness of the uh, entity. And the other argument about the signature of the award, uh, I don't think that there's any language in the New York Convention provisions that you cited uh, in the report uh, say anything as to the human identity of the person making the award just about the presence of a signature. And I believe also an argument could be made that the act of passing a ruling through the blockchain constitute at least something that could be construed an, as analogous to an electronic signature, which I believe in many jurisdictions uh, has been recognized as a valid form of signature likely to satisfy the requirement in the convention. So I think uh, these are just thoughts that could be used uh, in improving the justification for going forward with using uh, a proposal like the one you're making uh, in the report, the one that has been tested as uh, workable uh, in this particular case. These are just comments. I'm not asking you any questions. Uh, just trying to give some ideas for further discussion. Uh, I did have a comment uh, uh, along the lines with the distinction between an arbitration at law versus an arbitration at uh, ex equo et bono. Uh, and, and, and it's pretty much uh, the same that Sophie said. I did read uh, in the arbitration clause that the arbitrator, not necessarily, not only the juror, not only the clerus jurors, but the arbitrator also is to decide the matter in a stricto derecho. And I wonder how this, this case I understand was given the uh, sums, the, the amount at uh, dispute was not likely to be very controversial in terms of uh, prompting the parties to appeal or, or challenge anything be before the local courts. But I believe that when you apply the same uh, model to uh, cases where the amount of dispute are larger, uh, then you might be confronting challenges along these lines. And, and, I, and I believe that part of the language in the arbitration clause needs to be refined as to avoid giving the parties um, avenues to challenge to challenge the award ex post. And this is uh, also inscribed 
in this uh, tradition of uh, the pathological arbitration clauses. Uh, I did get to say a final comment about the economics of the case. Uh, I, we are talking about a case here that was decided, uh, the, the, that adjudicated um, a dispute for, uh, for 4,000 Mexican pesos plus interest. And I believe uh, whatever rent that became past due after the award, uh, 4,000 pesos is about, I don't know, $200 today, maybe. Uh, I, I wonder about the cost of running the whole exercise on Clarus, uh, the reasons why in the arbitration award, there's nothing to that effect. I mean, to adjudicating costs to the losing party I think the uh, award is silent on that. So I wonder in the particular case who defrayed the cost of running the Claros arbitration and whether uh, there are concerns. We know from the, from the study that I co-authored that uh, using Claros, depending on re or relative to the, to the amount of dispute might be economically prohibitive. So not every case, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense, economical sense, for the parties to arbitrate on Claros every every case, unless the economics uh, of the case makes sense. And uh, what else? Uh, I'm from the Jurassic times of arbitration as well. Sophie, I have my uh, yellow sheet with notes. Um, I think that's all for the moment. I'm sure I'm missing another uh, point that I wanted to make, but in the interest of uh, starting a conversation, I'm going to just stop here. Thank you very much, Luis. Yeah, um, yes, I agree uh, with um, you totally that a case can be made about Claros being a valid arbitral uh, proceeding and that uh, since it is uh, actually located in France, uh, it can be considered as a foreign award under New York Convention for every other country, and uh, that um, the signature um, of jurors can be expressed in a digital way by sending their, their vote or their decision through the platform. So I think that's the ideal um, point that we should be looking for the, the day in which arbitration becomes uh, much more flexible in terms of, of how uh, digital platforms can be used uh, for more people to, to resolve their disputes and, and hence have uh, wider access to justice. However, um, because of uh, how the, the New York Convention is uh, drafted and how it has been so far interpreted by the courts, I think that uh, it would be very difficult for a Claro's uh, decision to be recognized and enforced as an arbitral award. Um, not that, well, not that a case cannot be uh, made for, for it to, to be such. Um, however, it would be interesting to, to you know, um, run some strategic litigation in, um, uh, in a very, in, in a friendly, let, let's say arbitration friendly jurisdiction uh, in order to, to test if, if, we can, if we can get a Claro's decision to, to be recognized as an arbitral award under New York Convention or under, or under the statutes that regulate arbitration in, in any given jurisdiction. About this particular case, the case that we chose for, for testing the model, well, the arbitral clause was drafted uh, in a very um, meticulous way to meet all the requirements of a local law, which is the civil code of the state of Jalisco, uh, as a law that regulates, substantively regulates uh, civil relations in, a, in one state of Mexico, which is Jalisco. Um, uh, paradoxically, commercial arbitration is uh, way more, uh, you know, modern and, um, and state of the art 
it's a federal matter. It is drafted, you know, the federal law about commercial arbitration in Mexico. It's it's shaped after the ancestral model law, and um, it, it's it's way it would be way easier to to pull this uh, exercise exactly in the same way for a larger kind of arbitration in commercial arbitration. But um, in civil matters, uh, the law is uh, way more old and the, uh, the requirements for an arbitration clause are much more strict. And that's, that's one of the reasons why this particular arbitral clause is so wordy and it's so um, seemingly over um, uh, complex. Um, however, um, it is my uh, opinion that this kind of civil disputes of small claims or, or um, um, you know, business and relations that happen outside the commercial world uh, are probably uh, those that are in more need of this kind of tools, as uh, you know, like Claros and, and access to digital platforms. So it's um, unfortunately the commercial laws are advanced, you know, more, more rapidly. But it is my opinion that it is the civil world that more, more desperately needs these kind of tools. So um, we, we chose a civil affair and uh, in something that is so common for Mexican society as a real estate leasing agreements that, that uh, are actually a headache for uh, a large part of the population in Mexico. And I'm sure that it, it's the same in, in other jurisdictions and countries. And that's, well, that's, that's the reason why we chose this, this kind of, of disputes that even though they are more complex than commercial relations and commercial regulations, we think that they are the ones that need most these kind of solutions. Let me let me just add something because we uh, this is relevant and we typically discuss this um, in the context of the New York Convention, which was signed in 1958, right? Under a very different situation, a very different economic uh, well world economy. There is also since we started Claros, there is something that we are seeing that are basically changing among regulators, like um, in particular in the UK. There is this uh, report that was uh, published in May and for which we were consulted at Claros. It's called Digital Dispute Resolution Rules uh, done by the UK Jurisdiction Task Force. And just let me mention some of the items that they, they may, I'm not going to read it, of course, but some of the items that they mention are, uh, for example, um, automated methods of dispute resolution. You know, the outcome of any automatic dispute resolution process shall be legally binding on interested parties. So there's, uh, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, proposal to 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 accept, you know, AI uh, in dispute resolution. Then there is optional anonymity of parties, uh, and then there is uh, a number of provisions regarding, um, you know, the absolute right of the parties to to choose the method they they want to use for 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 the their arbitration, right? And um, so what we see this from our perspective is a changing. Changing ideas of, of regulators and changing, I know, mindsets or adapting to, to technology. A lot of this has to do with, well, the work that Sophie has been doing at Arctic. And, you know, uh, people are seeing that uh, there are other ways in order to, to solve disputes. Maybe this is something I can add to this discussion because it's something we have experienced since like the three years we have been working at, at Claros. There's absolutely no question from uh, from where I'm sitting anyway that um, Claros is earning slowly its place on the spectrum of offers of dispute resolution tools. Uh, the uh, I mean Federico and I have written about this uh, before on several occasions, but the uh, advent of e-commerce and the fact that we are now all all of us live online and transact online. And we entered into we enter into these instantaneous transactions. We pay instantaneously. Um, we want to have 
uh, dispute resolution system that is that matches that speed and that matches hopefully at, in, in due course the, the, low, the low cost and none of this is addressed adequately by uh, the uh, existing systems of court um, uh, court systems and, 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 and traditional arbitration. It is addressed to a degree by uh, certain ODR platforms or and, and uh, also certain bot animated um, systems of dispute resolution, but sometimes people want humans. Uh, and, and that is where I think for certain disputes, uh, there is a positioning to be made on, in the landscape of dispute resolution that is very, very attractive for users. Doesn't mean that, you know, other offers or options will completely disappear. Maybe they will for certain types of disputes, but you see, you see new kinds of disputes arising. The UK where I live uh, and practice has been embracing uh, technology as an aid to, the, to, uh, to access to justice and to help uh, bring it up to the mainstream. And it's, it's, it, it has always been quite open-minded about dispute resolution, very arbitration friendly, for example, in days where the courts didn't like arbitration, they saw it as a threat. Um, but, and, and so it's very nice to see it embracing that and others will follow for sure. I want to open some time for questions. Um, maybe someone from the audience. I see a beer. Uh, I'm sure a beer will have some comment or question about this. A beer is one of uh, our fellows. Um, and he has a view on everything. So a beer, please. Of course. <laughs> and he knows about everything. He has research clearance for oil and gas, for yeah. uh, domain name disputes. Um, a beer. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. You all are far too kind. Um, so I'm just going to, um, you know, add my own comment onto the entire enforceability under the New York Convention um, issue, because this is kind of my major sticking point right now. So a lot of the time when people speculate that Kleros is enforceable under the New York Convention, all they're doing is they're reading the text of the convention, right? And they're saying, oh, okay, we can maybe fit this in. But the problem is, that the way um, jurisprudence and practice involving the New York Convention has evolved, has evolved the substantive, uh, you know, meet the text itself, right? Because there's only like, I think eight or nine articles, it's a three page document. The actual source of our norms when we interpret the New York Convention is actually the consistent and continuous practice of courts around the world in interpreting the New York Convention. So um, when, when we, when we do discuss enforceability under the convention, we have to see how exactly are courts interpreting the issues that arise because um, the New York Convention has taken a bit of a transnational jurisprudence nature in how it operates. So, Coming to the point of enforceability of Kleros, when someone says that Kleros is not enforceable under the New York Convention, they're not concerned with whether the award can be considered foreign or not, because that's the absolute last thing they're concerned with. What they are concerned with is more fundamental traditional norms, legal norms, which form the basis of how we make decisions relating to justice and enforceability. For one instance, you know, there's this idea that no judge should have a vested outcome, have a vested interest in the outcome of a dispute, right? So the, the entire idea is sure you can pay a judge, but you should not pay him based on who he votes for. Now, this is what Kleros violates because, you know, jurors are paid depending on whether they're consistent or not, right? And this also like sort of nullifies the possibility of good faith, dissent and so on and so forth. This entire process, this mechanism flies stark in the face of our traditional ideas of, you know, when is a judge impartial and neutral? That is one major concern. Another major concern, for instance, is the entire idea of anonymity, sorry, anonymity of crowdsourced jurors, right? Anyone all over the world can 
uh, be a juror in Kleros, right? They can have, they can be your friend, they can be your uncle, anyone. Now, the entire idea of enforceability under the New York Convention is that even if you do not allow parties to choose their arbitrator, for instance, if a uh, arbitral institution to chooses the arbitrator for the parties, the parties should at least be able to vet that arbitrator, see what you know financial incentives or what relation he has to the parties and challenge him accordingly. The entire possibility of challenging a juror is eliminated in Kleros because you know you do not know who your jurors are in the first place. And Kleros actually advertises the fact that you know we are okay with you uh, conscripting your father to preside over your dispute for you. Now, the problem here is that while we might say in the sense of game theory that the Kleros processes work, our, our ideas and all of these norms, these have evolved over thousands, literally thousands of years. And no matter which uh, legal tradition you are on, you know, common law, uh, civil law, socialist law, the, there are some of these basic norms that are, I would say, universal. What Kleros does is it, you know, contravenes those universal norms. And those norms have been encoded into the way the New York Convention is interpreted. You know, when like the question is whether the, the arbitrator was impartial, was he neutral, was he biased and all. So, where, so like the question is not, is uh, Claro's enforceable under the New York Convention because I can tell you 100% if this goes to any appellate court and the question is, can we enforce it under the New York Convention? The answer is no. If the court decides to uh, enforce it otherwise, they will have their, uh, their other reasons, you know, but they will not be using the New York Convention to enforce uh, the awards because Claro's appends how we do law traditionally, how we resolve disputes traditionally. So we need to look either beyond our, uh, the New York Convention or we need to work on ensuring that courts, you know, liberate themselves from their understanding of the New York Convention because this is something you actually appreciate once you study the enforcement of awards or practice the enforcement of awards because, you know, actually um, conducting arbitrations is uh, completely different from proving that the arbitration was valid. And that's where most of the issues relating to enforceability under the New York Convention rise up. So that's just the um, comment I need to make because I will be um, honest, it's a bit of a pet peeve for me when people speculate that, you know, Clarus is enforceable under the convention and they only look at the text of the convention but not actually the practice of the courts. So in case anyone has any comments for that, I'm all ears. I don't know if anyone wants to, to comment on that. Um, I think that, uh, well, the one thing that blockchain has is that it's enforced by a smart contract, right? So um, the, 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 the ruling is just enforced and then, well, you can be not happy, but my, my question, and this is something I have discussed with Sophie many times, like um, what's, the, what's this conflict between both parties agreeing to any given method and the autonomy of parts to choose mm -hmm. the arbitration they want which, well, I learned from Sophie that this is one of the main tenets of arbitration since, since the beginning, you know, and some rules, procedural rules to which we think that um, a resolution method should um, be held yeah. to. This conflict, I, I don't know what is the solution, maybe, but you guys, uh, of course, are, are more experienced and you can maybe give your, your opinion. Yeah, um, you know, that's, thank you very much for uh, mentioning that because I forgot it in my last rant. When you talk about, you know, smart contract enforceability, that is something that courts might actually be against, right? Because in arbitration, there's something known as the second look or second bite doctrine, where um, the courts say that even if the parties, you know, agreed to a binding arbitration, when it comes to a, enforcement, the courts might still choose and might still like retain the ability to look at the award and see whether or not you know it should be enforced because not every award you know is always between the two parties it might end up sort of um, bringing in with it certain social or economic interests that the state has a vested interest in upholding you know they, it might violate certain 
let's say competition law or antitrust law norms, right? Which may be acceptable to the parties, but it might not be acceptable to the wider market, or it might just be patently unfair in some other way. It might be an illegal contract, like the contract for human trafficking supply or something like that. So or even like the entire idea of like having smart contracts is something that courts might see as against their public policy and they might always want to retain some degree of power over that decision. And that's something actually, you know, I've actually been researching, you know, uh, I might be sending a survey out um, to Claro's jurors in a few months as, as well as normal practitioners as part of my own research, you know, like how do you consider the idea of having a 30 day grace period like we have in this dispute resolution process known as adjudication where the award is not binding for 30 days in order to allow a court to look into it and decide whether it should be enforced or not. So I will be like circulating these sort of questions out to practitioners and users in the coming few months. So let's see how that goes. Well, we are almost out of time and I want to be respectful of, of everyone's time because it's late in Europe and I, I don't even want to know what time is where you are a beer now. 3 a.m. <laughs> 3. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to let you maybe some closing statements. Um, for me, it's really, I'm really happy like this for, for us, for Claros, it's like a, a big milestone of something that we have been working very, very hard to, 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 for, for it to happen and, and it finally happened. So yeah, we're thrilled. I'm very, very emotional today. Um, so I'm just going to, to let maybe uh, first uh, Sophie, then Luis, and finally I'm going to let Mauricio, as he did the, this research, um, comment on, on this. So Sophie, your final, final word, please. I wanted to commend Cleros for its vision and for its resilience, uh, because it uh, was not an obvious proposition to start with to uh, take on the justice system and the way that uh, that disputes are resolved. So congratulations and keep up the good work. And very quickly, if I may, uh, security guard is kicking me out of a building. Uh, <laughs> I just I just wanted to say that as a community, we need to come together and start working on uh, articulating a narrative as to. Uh, the benefits that are attached to exercises like the one uh, Mauricio uh, conducted in Mexico. I believe we have devoted a good chunk, if not the entirety of this call to uh, discussing theoretical aspects in the New York Convention and the nitty gritty of how the experiment was crafted. Next time we gather to discuss a similar topic, I would like to hear and for us to talk about uh, the practical benefits for arbitrators and arbitral institutions, for example, that are using Cleros as in Mauritius proposal as a tool to make their, their, their jobs easier and more efficient. And what is the ultimate benefit or the added value that that practice could uh, mean uh, for the users? Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for coming, Luis. Mauricio, well, you're the hero. Uh, uh, thank you. I would like to thank you all for, for, for your comments, for the invitation, for, for the interest uh, of, of reading this work and, and you know, um, making it part of the Claros community. I hope that it, uh, that it grows uh, and it uh, starts being replicated in other jurisdictions and start being perfected in Mexican jurisdiction and, you know, just start a movement uh, that makes um, access to justice easier for, for more people. As a final remark, I, I'm sure that the way in which the law will be developing in the next years will be towards this kind of, of, of tools. Um, I, I agree, current jurisprudence and current laws are, are, are quickly getting outdated and they're, they're also quickly uh, trying to adopt new stance about how digital uh, tools can, can improve justice and, and um, however, this, this will take some time. And we, what is more dangerous in my view is that uh, most, you know, more developed countries uh, will adapt faster and will incorporate this kind of tools faster. So in the next 10 to 20 years, I think that we can see a, a you know, the, the, the development gap just um, 
just grow bigger among countries, which is not necessarily a good uh, good scenario. So the 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 easiest we make for the least developed countries and regions to accommodate these tools into their systems, the the shorter the, the development gap will be in the world. So I think it's a, it's a very good effort. And I just want to congratulate Clara and all of its team. Uh, keep up the good work, guys. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming. The report is already online, so you can read it. It's uh, on our website. And the recording of this call will be, of course, shared with all of you. Thank you, guys. And well, I'm very happy. This is a historic day. Bye-bye. Thank you.